Today's session is meant to introduce the changes that have been proposed in the draft version of EACCPF. I'd like to introduce our presenters tonight. Um, first, we have Ailey Smith, Senior Research Archivist at the University of Melbourne. Karen Bredenberg, um, EAS, TS EAS Co-Chair and Metadata Strategist at Comunal Forbundet Sidakibera. Uh, Kristen Arnold, the EAD Subteam Chair from Archives Portal Europe Foundation. And Silke Jagodzinski of the Prussian Secret State Archives and Chair of the EAC CPF Subteam. So at this point, we'll turn the presentation over to our presenters. Thank, thank you, Corey. Um, I will start off with just some minor remarks regarding TUCIS. So if you give me the next slide, Haley, please. So as you heard, the technical subcommittee on encoded archival standards at the Society of the American Archivists. And luckily for you, we have a presentation and a webinar already recorded, giving you all the background information that you need. So I'm just going to say, we take care of the formats you use and manage and to manage and for managing and sharing archival information. And our work is driven by comments, suggestions and bug reports. That's the, how we evolve the standards. It's not, not something we are, are sitting doing on our own. It's your input who, which drives our work forward. So next slide. And of course, we are available, available in a lot of places. Uh, we have one page for the whole committee. Uh, we are maintaining the standards on GitHub. So there is one way to access, uh, access them. But we also have publication, both of the EID tag library schema and the AC uh, tag, tag library schema. Uh, all the, these links will be available in the final end for you if you haven't found them already. We do have one mailing list for all the, the standards we are working with, and that's the EAD uh, at, uh, mailing list at Library of Congress. And we also have, besides using GitHub, we have a form where you can report an issue. But the main thing today is why we are having this session. So on the next slide, we are talking about the standards revision. We do minor changes during a uh, normal year. Uh, we have set up a re revision cycle and sort of manifest for it. It's available in GitHub, but we haven't just created the standard and do minor updates. Following the guidelines that the standards committee hosted by SIA, which we are a subcommittee to, there are every standard needs to go through a revision every, every fifth year. So five, a five year cycle for it to have minor changes and then it's the big revision starts to look over the standard to see the major changes needed. And with that, that's the work the EACCPF team has been doing for the last couple of, couple of years. It takes time, we gather input and we are currently gathering input. And to make you familiarize to, with this revision, I'm going to hand over to the EACCPF team and let them take us through this revision. So thank you very much, the EACCPF team and the floor is yours. Thanks, Karin. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing my co-presenter, Ailey Smith. She is a digital curation and archive specialist in the digital stewardship team at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Ailey has attended countless virtual team meetings monthly on her Friday nights. I thank you for that, Ailey. And she has worked to improve the tech library and the documentation, and Ailey is an expert in encoding dates in XML. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Silke. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Silke Jagodzinski, who is Head of the Digital Services and IT Unit uh, at the Geheime Stadtsaki Preußische Kulturbesitz uh, in Berlin, Germany. Uh, Silke is the team lead for the EAC CPF team, uh, and she is a, has been a major driving force uh, for getting this revision uh, to where it is now. So thank you, Silke. Thank you. Our latest and current version of the EAC CPF schema was approved in 2010. Ellie, could you? Thank you. Um, in 2010, in summer 2017, at the SAA annual meeting in Portland, Oregon, the TSAS decided to revise the standard version EAC CPF 2010. And um, a call for comment followed in September this year. And the community replied with feedback on bugs and requests for simplifying the encoding and for enhancements the description, especially the tech library. A technical update was published at the end of 2018, which is why the standard is called EAC CPF 2010 edition 2018 now. After the 2018 update, a major overhaul of the standard started in the EAC CPF team consisting of five to 10 members with the target of a revised EAC CPF 2.0 schema. We will present parts of this revised draft during the next 20 minutes. During our meetings, each element and each attribute of the schema was evaluated to simplify where it is possible, to align with EAD schema where it is useful, to implement features and solution upon our user's request and to clear up unused components. Since March this year, the EAC CPF 2.0 draft has been published with a call for comments. And in the call for comments, we provide schema files, XSD and RNG, Schematron, um, a conversion style sheet, a tech library without examples so far, as well as the revision notes and a questionnaire with a list of topics and um, we are deeply interested in to find more use cases or published examples. The call for comments closes end of June 2021. We are going to discuss the feedback and proposals and will include the results on the schema and in the documentation. We're going to produce a best practice guide and we aim to release a new version EAC CPF 2.0 at the end of 2021. And you can find all this information on our EAC CPF homepage. And now I'd like to hand over to Ailey again for more about simplifying the schema and EAD reconciliation. Oh, thanks, Silke. Um, I'll just start by talking briefly uh, about the design principles. So the TS EAS as a whole has newly established uh, set of design principles, which uh, feed into all the work we do and help to make things consistent across all the work that we do. Um, so this includes things like uh, controlling the uh, sequence that filed elements might appear within a parent element so it's consistent across everything. Uh, in an EAC CPF specific context, uh, the, this has also defined a couple of plural elements for bundling things. The first is the use of plural elements uh, like functions and places which group um, singular elements underneath them so a singular function place doc, uh, elements can be included within the parent plural elements. Uh, the second example is for the set elements, and these are used to group elements that have different concepts. So in the example of date set, you can have date underneath that or multiple date elements or date ranges or a combination of the two. Um, so as part, while we've been working on the EAC CPF revision, uh, there's also been work happening on looking at uh, what would be required to more closely align the EAD and EAC CPF uh, schemas as a whole. Um, this would address the considerable overlap between the two standards, um, as well as looking at uh, making them easier to maintain, uh, easier to teach and learn and use. Um, so it's also going to look at making sure that anywhere we have elements with the same name across both schemas, that they are defined in the same way and scoped in the same way and used in the same way. Uh, this has resulted in the renaming of some elements and attributes and addition of some elements and attributes. Uh, so as part of the alignment, several elements have been renamed. So the abbreviation has become short code. 
citations become reference. Uh, place entry in EAC CPF has become place name. Um, I think in EAD it's geog name at the present. Um, and I probably should emphasize that the changes will be applied to EAC CPF in this revision. Uh, and subsequently when EAD has a revision, then they will also flow into that one. So EAC CPF will happen first. Uh, we've also renamed several elements to be more precise. So EAC CPF, the top element is now just EAC. Uh, name entry parallel has been a renamed name entry set. And this also refers back to uh, the design principles I talked about just before, where we're looking at making sure we're using these things consistently. Um, there are several replaced or removed elements. We have replaced source entry uh, with reference uh, and removed the outline with list elements as well as object in wrap. Um, and in order to encode lists that are hierarchical or a little bit more complex, which you would previously have done using outline and level. Um, we've added the ability to nest a list element within other list elements. Um, and this is an example of creating a sort of genealogy using in nested lists. So there's a number of lists embedded in there. Uh, it's also using the new head element, which can be used to encode uh, titles or captions within lists and have a text. Uh, looking at external namespaces, so following on from the lead of the EAD team, uh, we're now looking at renaming the uh, Xlink and uh, XML namespaces. So we're replacing things like XML ID with and just an ID attribute, or Xlink href is now being replaced with a symbol href um, attribute. Uh, and there are several Xlink attributes that have been removed from the schema. Um, as part of the revision, uh, there are some optional attributes that have been added to all elements. Uh, these are ID, target and audience. So ID and target can be used for internal um, referencing within an instance and are available on all elements. And audience can be used in order to specify whether the audience, whether elements are available uh, to everyone or just within the repository requirement. Um, We've also, to any elements that have content, have added the optional language of element or script of element attributes. Uh, these can be used to specify the language and or script that the element is using. And this is particularly useful when we might have uh, multilingual EAC CPF instances or where instances feature um, translations of some of the content. So you can specify the different languages being used. And I'm just going to hand back to Silke to talk about the control area. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's begin with the control area. The control area is mainly updated for EAD alignment and to simplify the schema. Changes due to EAD alignment are new optional attributes. You see here country encoding, date encoding, language encoding, repository encoding, script encoding um, in the element control for external encoding standards. And we have, and we also added the new optional element representation as a child element of control. Furthermore, we have some elements that were transformed to attribute, uh, attributes as we realize there are more property information about the ESC instance than data, which means they are more likely data about data. See our solution here. There are elements to encode the status information on an EAC CPF instance like maintenance status and publication status. Both become attributes in the control element as they are properties of this ESC instance, but not data about this ESC instance. Here you see an example with the new attributes, um, the audience and base and country encoding. And here you see the maintenance status and publication status attributes. Um, imagine more attributes around, especially the global attributes Eli just talked about. And there are also two elements uh, with type information were turned into attributes within the maintenance event. To describe the maintenance history of the EAC instance, the element event type and agent type become attributes of the element maintenance event and agent. Again, we have an example here um, with the new attributes maintenance event with the maintenance event type created and agent with the agent type human here, 
I mean, it's a, it's a group, but we call it human. And um, just imagine more optional attributes around this, these both uh, within, the, within the elements. We set solution for elements in control vanished and were transformed into attributes. Within the control area, we also emphasize existing elements. The convention declaration in control will be used to provide conventions and rules for transliterations and for any forms of names. Information given in the element source, in the element source and maintenance event, lays the foundation for the description of an assertion to the EAC CPF description. Ali will explain that later on. The optional attribute, attribute local type is used to support an element semantically. The specification of values available in local type is given in the local type declaration. With some new optional reference attributes, we are able to link to a specific convention declaration, maintenance event, source, and local type declaration. In detail, we are able to link to the ID attributes of the respective elements. And um, as you can imagine, these attributes names, like attribute names like convention declaration reference and local type declaration reference become one of our favorites in the new schema, and you'll see some use cases later on. Ailey is, I uh, will say more about linking and referencing now. Okay, so I'll start with external referencing. Um, we've got some attributes here. So we've got the uh, value URI, vocabulary source, a vocabulary source URI, uh, which can be used on certain elements in order to link to external uh, vocabularies or ontologies that uh, relate to the data. Um, to reference external sources for the contents of EAC CPF instances, you can use the reference element, uh, which is within source in the control area of the instance. Uh, reference can include the href attribute uh, in order to link to a specific uh, address for a remote resource. Um, reference is also available uh, on some other elements, uh, such as event and abstract files to reference uh, external resources in a specific context. Um, I'm on the wrong screen. <laughs> okay, so in this example here, uh, we've got a few different ways to do the external referencing. So in the top case, it's using the control area to link to an external source, which is the Barack Obama Presidential Library, and that includes the uh, href there. In the second example, uh, this is a name entry for Barack Obama. It's using the vocabulary source URI to point to uh, Wikidata and the value URI to point to the specific value uh, where this name entry has come from. So that's how we reference things out of there. And in the third example, it's using a relation uh, where there is a reference at the bottom that's pointing to an external resource as a Seymour type of reference there. Uh, when we look at internal referencing, um, so there's some enhanced options for referencing within a single EOC CPF uh, instance. Now we have the ID attribute available everywhere and that's on all elements. Uh, and this can be used to assign an identifier that's unique within the instance um, to any element. Uh, there's also the new target element uh, attribute, sorry. Uh, that can be used to refer to the ID of another element within the instance. Uh, you can also reference specific elements in the control area use from descriptive elements uh, in an AIC CPF instance using specific attributes, but I'll be talking about that in the next section. Um, and first we'll have a look at an example of um, using ID and target attributes to link within a single instance. So this is some snippets of data. It's not a complete record, uh, but at the top you've got an occupation uh, where the place is bound and that place has a target attribute of place one. So what that's doing is linking that place name there to the ID that appears below on the place record there, where down is described in a lot more detail. Uh, so you can link between the two sections in a single EAC CPF instance. Uh, assertion descriptions. Uh, so these have been added based on some user feedback that has received. Um, 
and looking at including evidence-based assertions uh, for statements made in the ACCPF instance. So for any sort of elements within the instance and the descriptive part, uh, it's possible to uh, add information about who, create, who made the assertion, what the source is that the assertion comes from, and any rules that are related to that. Uh, and this can be particularly useful in cases where there might be conflicting information. So there might be different spellings of a name, or there might be different dates of birth, um, and they're coming from different sources. So you can make it very clear where this information has come from, and you know that a little bit later if there are conflicts. Um, so then using the new maintenance event reference, source reference and convention declaration reference attributes, uh, you can point from an element in the descriptive section of the record back to a maintenance event source or convention declaration entity uh, within the control section where that information would be. And you can also refer to more than one of these from a single element. So the best thing to do is to look at an example of this. Um, so in this case, we have a maintenance event, which would be up in the control section, where John Smith has made an update on um, the 23rd, uh, 23rd of February this year. Uh, we have a source, which is pointing to the history of the University of Oregon. We also have a specific page in that reference where this information comes from. The bottom is the relation, which would be further down in the record. And this relation is pointing to the source of this information and who updated the record to include this. So that's all included within the, ref the relation and you can trace that, which is very useful. Um, and now back to Silke for names. Yeah, so name encoding. Um, encoding various forms of names is essential for ESC CPF producers. There are different reasons that makes it necessary to encode several um, names for one entity. And feedback from our users community showed that the name encoding was to elaborate um, for fast and simple encoding. So first we renamed the element name entry parallel to name entry set. Eddie said that before. And it still it can still it can still contain one or more name entries and dates you can still also use a single name entry for an entity without for an entity without its wrapper element if needed similar to our proposal in the control area we transformed some elements to attributes as we think they are properties of a name the elements authorized form and alternative form used to identify the status of the name according to a particular set of rules were transformed to an optional status attribute uh, with the values authorized uh, or alternative and it, it's, it appears in the uh, name entry element. The element preferred form was used was turned into an attribute with the same name with boolean expression true or false preferred form preferred form is is used to uh, indicate if a, if a name is uh, preferred for display, so to say. Rules or conventions um, to express a name or according to which the name is authorized or alternative can be defined in convention declaration and above in the control area. By the way, the same applies to any rule or convention you have to you have to mention the new optional attribute convention declaration reference a name entry points directly to the according convention declaration especially or well, which means to the id attribute here uh, we have an example it is also a snippet so please imagine more more information around we have the uh, convention declaration with the id cd1 um, we have the reference to a french standard, I think. And we have a name entry, which is a preferred form. It's an authorized uh, name entry, and it is authorized a, a according to the con to the FNOR, NF, Z, whatever, uh, which is mentioned in the convention declaration um, with ID CD1. In our next example, um, again, it's a snippet Please imagine more translations of a name, use dates, and so on within this uh, name entry set. 
Uh, we use the well-known attribute local type to indicate if various names are parallel names, if they are translation or native names. So here we have a name entry set with two names. Uh, they are parallel names. Um, the first one is the preferred form for the display. The status is it is the authorized name and it is a native name from Anna, Hannah Arendt. Um, it's a German form or it's a German name. And the second name entry is a Japanese form. It's a translation of Hannah Arendt. It is also authorized, but it's not the preferred form for display. This, this, this is one example um, to, to solve all these issues around preferred authorized alternative names and their rules and conventions. And now it's Ali again for the new place encoding. Thank you. Um, so a little bit about the way places are working. So place can be encoded in full within some of the plural elements such as within places. Uh, it can also be encoded, you know, the place element can be used within relations and within chronological lists as well. Um, however, the new place name uh, it's not a new plate, the renamed place name entry entity uh, can be used within um, some of the singular elements such as uh, function, occupation and mandate uh, without the additional encoding. And in the example we saw earlier, you can have the place name there, which links to more details in a full place description uh, using the target and ID attributes. Um, so Within the place element itself, uh, it now, now requires at least one sub-element of the following type. So it's either the place name, role of a place, physical address, contact information, or geographic coordinates. Uh, now the place name entry is highly recommended to be included all the time. Uh, however, you must have at least one of those elements within place. Um, in this new version of EAC CPF, there is a, an additional contact element. Uh, this works very much like the existing address element. However, while address is encoding a physical address, a contact can be used for providing contact details, such as an email address, phone number, or digital addresses like a website. Uh, the other change is geographic coordinates are now encoded in an element uh, as opposed to the former way of doing it using the latitude, longitude or altitude uh, attributes. Uh, and date information and sort of additional descriptive information can also be included within place. Uh, and here we have another snippet type example. It's actually a fairly complete uh, record for a place. Um, so we have a place name, the Tokyo Imperial Palace. It has a role, uh, includes geographic coordinates, uh, includes the street address uh, for the Imperial Palace. And in this case, it uses a new contact element to include the homepage uh, for the Tokyo Imperial Palace. Um, looking at some of the changes for date encoding, uh, as part of the alignment with EAD and also based on some user feedback about the difficulty encoding uh, certain dates, and uh, unknown dates in the existing version of EAC CPF. Uh, we've made some changes here. So one thing where things are uncertain, we've adopted the certainty attribute uh, from EAD uh, in order to be able to specify certainty of around dates, uh, along with adopting calendar and era attributes to provide a little more information. Uh, dates can also be normalized around certainty using extended date time format or EDTF. Uh, and that's been adopted in the most recent version of the ISO 8601 standard. Um, and we've also added a new status attribute uh, to from date and to date, which means that where you have a date range, you can indicate where part of the date range is unknown or the date range is actually ongoing. Um, and some examples here, once again, we've got snippets. So in the first one, it's using the certainty attribute to say that it's a circa date. We don't really, we know it's around 1789, but we don't know for certain. And that allows you to encode that. In the second example, it's a date range. Uh, and this is a date range where the start, the from date or the start of the date range is unknown. So it's using the status equals unknown to specify that. And the to date or the end of the date range, um, 
it's uncertain. And so in the text within the uh, tags, it's got circa 210. However, in the standard date, it's using 0210 question mark. And that question mark is the EDTF value that indicates uncertainty there. Uh, and the third example is a date set, which includes a single date uh, with a standard date on it um, and a date range as well, where the end of the date range or the two date is ongoing. So the date range, it started, but it's, it might be an organisation that's still continuing to operate. So it's saying that is an ongoing date range and there is actually no date in the two days. And it's back to Silke for relations. Thank you. Thanks, Ailey. Um, relations got a new encoding structure to simplify and for better interoperability. The relations encoding is more generic now. The optional element relations, the plural element still serves as a wrapper element for one or more uh, relation, uh, single relation entries, but we removed the elements function relation, resource relation, and CPF relation in favor of, of a generic singular element relation. Each element relation contains at least one required element target entity to identify the related entity. An attribute target type specifies the type of the entity as an agent, meaning a corporate body, a person, or family. The target type could also be a resource or a function. The targeted entity can be named with the text and the element content and or encoded with URIs referencing to an authority record or any other external file using the new optional attributes, vocabulary source, vocabulary URI and vocabulary source URI, which Ailey mentioned before. The optional element relation type Within relation specifies the type of a relation that the EAC CPF entity has to the targeted entity. Relation types are not fixed and can be given as identity, hierarchical, temporal, family, or associative, but also as creator or subject of a resource. Relations between the entity being described and the function could be controls, owns, or performs. Assert new target element is called target role and can be used to provide information about the role of a targeted entity towards the entity described. Family roles like parent, child or sibling can be, can be given in that text element. Furthermore, relation context can be given with date, place and descriptive information in the according child elements you see down below. The example shows the new or well, one new relation encoding. Um, we have the relations wrapper element. We have a first relation singular element with the target entity. The target entity is referred, well, refers to the vocabulary source and attributes refer to uh, um, authority file. The target type is a person. Uh, then we have the child elements part, which are have given and the family name. So it's obviously Paul Arendt, the um, targeted entity. And the relation type is family and the target role is parent. So we can assume that Paul Arendt was a parent, so probably a father of the entity described, which is Hannah Arendt, you have seen before in the name encoding. So, and of course, it is, it is possible to add many more relation entries here to any other uh, agent or um, resource or function. Okay, that's what we'd like to, to present about the new EAC CPF 2.0 encoding. And as previously mentioned, more in detailed inform information, some example encodings and all files are available on our standards homepage, eac.staatsbibliothek-berlin.de in the menu item schema revision 2021. And again, I'd like to ask you to take a look at our questionnaire. We are especially interested in your opinion on language encoding and usage of namespaces within your XML files. 
in terms of schema alignment mentioned by Adi before, the results may affect the upcoming EAD revision. If you're already using EACCPF, we would like to see your files for encoding examples, for real life encoding examples. And we would like to see how somebody is using multiple identities, if someone does. We would also like to see evidence-based assertions. So please take a look at our questionnaire to learn about the areas of EACCPF we've, ident we've identified to be fuzzy. But enough talk from me and Ellie. It's your turn to ask any question or give us your opinion on this present EACCPF 2.0 draft in our following Q&A session. <laughs> 